Testing. Well, good evening, everyone. I think we'll make a start now. Thank you ever so much for coming today. Uh, we have a very special talk by um, someone who's very knowledgeable on this subject. Uh, I'm Casper, by the way, um, vice slash technically president of EARS as of yesterday, I guess, um, who has been ever so kindly offered to host today's talk, which will be on the USAT satellites and a little bit on the history of SSTL, mainly on USAT 2, as 14 days ago marked its 40th anniversary. And uh, surprising enough, the satellite is still working to this day. It's something I'll talk about a little bit towards the end of the lecture on how we can do it as part of EARS, because we actually got our own satellite ground station to be able to receive it. In fact, we actually received it last Christmas. But I think I'll pass it on to the, the main speaker of the day, um, who has worked with the USAT spacecraft um, for, as a, sorry, sp worked with the USAT spacecraft data from his time as a physics teacher in Scarborough between 1983 and 85. He joined Martin Sweeting, who's joining us at the front uh, today, um, and with the USAT team in January 1986, where he produced educational support materials while he developed the new BBC microbase ground station facilities and acted as one of the USAT spacecraft operators. He analyzed space radiation effects on the USAT 2 memory systems, and this later fed into his Surrey PhD research. At this time, he also became responsible for the thermal design of the next generation of USAT spacecraft, and analysis of the USAT 2 temperature data played a key role in its confirming the accuracy of the models. So could we please give a warm welcome to Professor Kay Gunderwood, who is planning to this sort of thing. Well, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming to this talk, and it's a pleasure to see you. And it's a particular pleasure to have the man himself who started this whole program, Professor Sir Martin Sweetie, uh, a fantastic leader who made all this happen. So it's my pleasure to talk about the early history. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about how Martin got started uh, and also how I got started in this business because it was a slightly strange way of uh, entering a, a career in space. Wasn't, wasn't in the plan. <laughs> so I'm going to talk about uh, the two first USATs, USAT-1 and USAT-2, but of course these were amateur radio satellites, so they're also known as OSCAR-9 and OSCAR-11, OSCAR standing for Orbital Satellite Carrying Amateur Radio. There were the ninth and eleventh of those. So Martin came here right at the start, was in fact as Surrey was still being built in 1970, and he began his degree in the uh, Department of Electronic and Electrical Engineering. Um, so he's a fine graduate of our department, and um, uh, of course he's a, a keen radio amateur enthusiast. And uh, so he carried on to do his PhD research here, and he was looking at uh, shortwave antennas and uh, the communications efficiency of electrically short aerials, as, as we sometimes used to use that word in those days, which he completed in 1979. And ironically, that's the same year that I was just going to university, or starting university. Well, Martin, like myself, and in fact, much of the sort of so-called baby boomer generation, of course, we were lucky enough to live through the Apollo space program and the space race of the 1960s, leading ultimately to Neil Armstrong walking on the moon in 1969. And that was a great inspiration to, to many of us, including Martin and myself. And also, at that time, there were some great films around. Uh, if, and if those of you who follow science fiction, I do recommend the novels of Arthur C. Clarke and indeed Isaac Asimov. Uh, Arthur C. Clarke's uh, very short story was turned into a great film, 2001, A Space Odyssey. It's the sort of film you have to watch about three times before you have any idea what it's about. <laughs> but it was a fantastic uh, uh, film and also very inspiring. So this combination of interest in space and radio, I suppose, naturally led Martin to think about setting up a satellite receiving station here at Surrey. And that was a very early one. Uh, as things go. So here's a picture of Martin back in 1978 in what we call the BB building, <clears throat> sort of at the top near, near one of the lift shafts uh, with just the beginnings of the uh, ground station there. And in the uh, picture, you can see a typical, uh, what was called WeFax weather satellite image. So if I point out that one, that one is the visible channel. So in fact, it's taken through an orange filter to give good contrast between clouds. You see a nice front coming in there. The UK, you can just see, coast of France, etc. And then this is a thermal infrared picture. So in this one, white is cold. So obviously that cloud front there 
is actually quite high, so it's quite cold, and you see the, the bright white. Notice how uh, warm Britain is compared to the sea around it, so that would depend upon the time of year that it was taken. Now, uh, WeFax used the same tone system uh, to transmit data as the sort of phone networks of the time did, the fax machines of the time. And if I play a sample, You'll notice it gets stronger as the satellite gets closer. And you'll hear a distinct tick-tock, tick-tock, tick-tock sound. Each of those tick-tocks are the, that and that coming through. And the high tone you hear is actually AM modulated picture. So you get the two, two pictures building up literally line by line as the satellite goes by. Let me just... People interested in radio spend a lot of time listening to noise like that. <laughs> now, the colour picture next to it is, in fact, the same picture, but uh, you don't get colour <laughs> from these satellites, so that's been artificially done by a computer. Now, Martin also managed to acquire somehow, I never did find out how, uh, a Navy um, sort of anti-aircraft radar type dish thing that was very heavy, but was just about possible to put it on top of the BB building, and you can see it there. For many years, that was a great landmark in Guildford, uh, as it used to track around and, and follow the satellites. It actually could track very quickly. It was designed to shoot down aircraft. Um, Martin, of course, was also operating the amateur radio satellites. Now, these were known as phase two satellites in that they carried active transponders. So you could talk via the satellite as they passed by. So for a few minutes, you know, sort of five to ten minutes, you have this opportunity to, say, talk to another radio amateur in Europe uh, or down in, in Scandinavia, potentially even down to Africa uh, as the satellite went by. And uh, Oscar 6 and Os Oscar 7 were in the sky at that time, operating in low Earth orbit, in sort of polar orbit, so going over the UK on a regular basis in the mornings and in the late afternoons. But Oscar 6 had a problem, which uh, meant that its onboard uh, battery kept suffering uh, deep discharges. So Martin was able to set up an automated ground station, he said using uh, sort of central heated timers and things, and using tape. Uh, was able to send commands to help it to uh, overcome that particular problem, so help to uh, uh, extend the life of that satellite. So the experience of doing all this meant that uh, Martin learned a lot about uh, how to track a satellite. It wasn't done by computer in those days. It was done on one of these things, which is called an Oscar locator. Uh, yeah, there we are. So that circle is what's called the range circle for around the UK. So when the satellite crosses that horizon line there, it's within range. And when it goes out the other side, it's out of range. So that's the horizon to horizon. And you can see that curved track. That's the standard track of the satellite. And you just rotate that round, the pole, uh, uh, according to what the pass actually is. And then the, the tick marks on it are, I think, uh, one minute marks as it goes by. So it's amazing what you can do with a bit of paper in terms of tracking. Um, but that experience uh, led him to think, well, why not have a British amateur radio satellite? And so uh, while he was completing his PhD, uh, he started to put this uh, into action, this plan into action. And so the University of Surrey Satellite Project, USAT Project, was born. But the question is, of course, how do you do it? How do you build a satellite? How do you fund a, uh, doing such a thing? And how do you make it happen? And even if you could make it happen, what would it do? Would it be like the phase two satellites, something that's just a, a, an active transponder, very useful for amateur radio communications? Or could it be something more sophisticated, something that could uh, feed into another strand of amateur radio, and that is the self-education strand of amateur radio? So then, of course, it could support not just amateur radio enthusiasts, but actually schools and colleges, and hopefully encourage young people into engineering. Uh, it's always a difficult thing to persuade young people to come into engineering, but this could be a way to do that. So 
Um, just to set the picture to you, because of course we're all so used to technology, it's hard to think back to the 1970s, and the fact that um, integrated circuits were still pretty new uh, in the late 60s, early 70s, um, and it's just incredible how microelectronics has um, sort of been developed over really quite a short time. And it has to be said, the space program, and particularly the requirements of rockets, and it has to be said for ballistic missiles, played a very big role in the miniaturization of electronics. Because the problem of controlling a rocket is a very difficult problem. You need very sophisticated electronics to make that happen. And rockets in the 60s could not lift very much mass. So we had to miniaturize uh, uh, electronics into integrated circuits, etc. So the so-called TTL, transistor transistor logic, um, came out in 1964, and the that was the 54 series. In fact, USAT one and two used a lot of 54 series logic. It was power between power rails of zero and five volts, and then the 7400 series came out. That was a sort of more commercial plastic. Uh, encapsulated chips came out in 1966. The 54 series were actually ceramic encapsulated and glass bonded ceramic. Um, now TTL used uh, NPN and PNP transistors, so bipolar transistors. Actually, they're very good for space use because they're very robust against the effects of ionizing radiation in space. But unfortunately, they consume quite large amounts of power. <clears throat> and so um, later, uh, CMOS technology was developed and this MOSFET technology is very, very much lower power. So the 4000 series came out in 1968. RCA actually produced the first 4000 chips. So USATs 1 and 2 carried a mixture of CMOS chips, which operated between plus and minus um, uh, sort of 10 volts. They really should work between plus and minus 12, and uh, Norton 5 volt uh, chips. Now, in those days, then, computers were built using these chips. And although they're quite small, they're not massively integrated. So you might have just a few transistors on each chip. So literally, a computer would fill a room. And uh, you had these so-called mainframe computers that would fill an entire uh, room, sort of like one of our lab spaces in the university. And that would be a computer. You'd see these sort of tapes whirring around. It's all very impressive. But compared to what we have today, where you could do all this in something in your smartphone, or in fact, even smaller, um, it, it's, it's just a, an entirely different world. Mini computers started to come out, and the so-called PDP-11, which I programmed when I was a student, um, uh, was a sort of marvel because it was something that could fit on a desk. We thought that was fantastic. But um, it was with the next step in electronics, the step to what was called large-scale integration, and then ultimately very large-scale integration, that made the microcomputer revolution possible. So to give you a sort of scale, um, large-scale integrated circuits are about 1,000 to 20,000 transistors in a chip, and it was possible to build small computers with that sort of size. But uh, VLSI was more than 20,000 uh, transistors. Now, we used to think that was enormous. Of course, today, chips have billions of transistors uh, on them. So 1971 was a major step forward because it saw the world's first com commercial microprocessor, the Intel 4004. It's a four-bit processor. Um, uh, but very quickly, uh, a year later, the Intel 8008 came out, and that was a precursor of the 8080, which Martin used to hand-build uh, computers for the ground station in the early days, and then the 8085 and so on. In fact, it's the very start of the Intel family that we all use today in our PCs, but uh, that's kind of where it all began back in the 70s. So as you can see, that's happening while Martin is studying his degrees. Um, 1974 also saw some other microprocessors come in, like the Motorola 68000, uh, sorry, 6800, 68000 much later, and uh, the 6502. And it was these chips that enabled the uh, entrepreneurs of the day to start to build computers you could have at home. And so the micro uh, computer revolution of the late 70s, early 80s was born. And uh, I'm of that generation that was exposed to that as the first computers started to come in. So uh, Martin realized that microelectronics could make uh, a satellite really do something useful. So a small satellite could do something very useful. And uh, in sort of reference really to the concept of a microcomputer, 
then he thought, why not call it a microsatellite? So the microsatellite was born. Because it was small, it needed relatively few resources to build compared to a main uh, spacecraft, a sort of space agency spacecraft. It needed a small team to do it. And so actually the cost was quite reasonable, uh, much, much less than the cost of a traditional space system. So all he had to do was to raise the money. Not easy, but by going to the university authorities, he was able to get a sort of seed funding support. And then through, uh, I'm sure, uh, you know, talking to industry and charity and all sorts of things, uh, was able to raise um, the rest of the money and indeed the in-kind support that made USAT happen. And I think in total, it was, came to something like a quarter of a million pounds. Now, quarter of a million pounds in 1979, I think would be about two and a half million pounds today. So for someone who's, you know, a student at university to go out and get, you know, two and a half million quid is a quite something, quite remarkable. Um, so uh, he had a small laboratory, which he then turned into a clean room by means of plywood and I think plastic and uh, uh, sort of uh, air blower to keep the uh, dust out. And uh, you can see it there, actually, in the photograph uh, with a sort of mock-up there, actually, of USAT-1. So over many long nights and weekends, and that was going to be the story of the next decades, actually, uh, no holidays from 1979 to 1981, 30 months in total, USAT-1 gradually took shape. Uh, of course, doing this from scratch, so there's no prior experience, and you obviously can't do that without advice and help and so on. So it was good to have advice from the amateur radio community, the AMSAT community, particularly in the United States where, where they'd done these Oscar satellites before. Mechanical advice from industry, from British Aerospace who built spacecraft for the UK. Um, test advice from Ministry of Defense and RAE Farnborough played a big role in that. And of course, advice about the launch from Goddard Space Flight Center and McDonnell Douglas, the makers of the rocket. So um, by bringing all this expertise in and gaining advice for that, the different um, uh, bits of the satellite could be made as they would need to be made. But if you think about a satellite, it needs several things to make it work. It needs, of course, a structure that has to be made of the right sort of materials. We use an aerospace aluminium alloy, 6061 alloy, actually, uh, which is uh, used widely throughout the aerospace industry. Um, that was machined here in uh, the university. In fact, we have a colleague in the audience who did some of that machining. And uh, that was done on numerically controlled milling machines, which again was a new innovation in the 1970s. I think Concorde was the first real major aerospace project that actually used computer controlled milling lathes to actually produce materials. Uh, we need, of course, electrical power. So that's batteries, solar, solar cells, etc. We need uh, telemetry data so we can find out what the satellite's doing. We need to be able to command it, so we need a telecommand system. And we need to be able to track, that, that is to home in on the radio signal from the satellite. And of course, if you want the satellite to point in a particular direction, you need an attitude determination and control system. So we have to have sensors on board the spacecraft that can sense what the orientation of the satellite was. We use magnetometers and sun sensors and uh, horizon sensor, I think, as well. And um, also you need uh, actuators to make it point. And in this particular case, we used electromagnets and a passive system, uh, basically a long boom, uh, which acts as what we call a gravity gradient boom. And of course, you need radio systems, so transmitters and receivers. And actually, you also need thermal control. So that, what I think was courtesy of Dornier, <laughs> they <laughs> produces a nice sheet of this stuff which looks very shiny like aluminium foil. It's actually a plastic with aluminium on the back of it. The plastic is Teflon, uh, so PTFE, and it's um, transparent, unlike your frying pans at home, which are black. Um, and this goes very, very cold in space. And uh, that was put over pretty much everything that wasn't a solar cell. So all of those things were faced. We had the onboard computer, which was uh, uh, itself really an experiment. The 1802 was the sort of first CMOS microprocessor you could buy. Um, it also had a very experimental 16-bit uh, computer made by a, a British company, Ferranti, the F100L. That was the sort of thing that was put into military aircraft and missiles. Uh, it had HF radio systems, and uh, this was for probing the atmosphere. So phase-related 714, 21, and 28 megahertz signals 
feeding into Martin's interest in, uh, in that sort of uh, wave bands. But it also experimentally flew microwave bands, 2 gigahertz and 10 gigahertz as well. So it had lots of radio experiments on board. The fluxgate magnetometer, the thing that measured the magnetic field vector of the uh, scene as seen by the satellite, was actually provided by Mario Kuna, who had designed the fluxgate magnetometer on the Voyager spacecraft. So this was an identical system. And uh, uh, Mario gave, I think, very good support in terms of testing that and putting that in. And it was put into the tip mass of the boom, uh, which meant, of course, there were therefore cables running up the boom. And that turned out not to be such a good idea <coughs> when we came to deploy the boom, because sadly the, the cables uh, got snagged on deployment. So the boom never came out very far. But for the general communication, VHF and UHF, um, it could transmit on both and it could receive on both. And all of that was fed into one antenna farm. So I think Martin designed the circuit that did that. <laughs> There's lots and lots of you know, complexities to get, get it all to work on one antenna. And it had the world's first CCD camera ever flown in space, a British one made by uh, GC Marconi. And it had four bit pixels and was 256 pixels by 256 pixels, so <laughs> rather smaller than what's in your mobile phone. But uh, nonetheless, it was the first. Here's the systems diagram. So although these are small spacecraft, they're not simple. Uh, there's a lot of systems in there. And of course, the team had to work on all the different parts, bring it together and make that all happen. And Martin was able to manage that process, uh, as well as, of course, technically um, uh, build, uh, particularly the radio side of things, uh, through that. So it was a complicated program there. You can see many late nights of, uh, of work and activity, testing and building and testing, finally integrating all the satellite together in the clean room. And it has to be said that the layout of the was done um, using um, uh, sort of basically black tape on, on acetate. It was done essentially by hand because Computer aided design was very, very new. In fact, I think towards the end of the project, we had the first CAD station. So you didn't have PCs in those days. So there's no concept of sitting down at a computer with a CAD program and just designing it. We had a CAD station, just one, uh, and that was certainly useful for USAT 2 and the later satellites. So it's a completely different world. And it makes you wonder now how it was at all possible to, to do all the work that was done. So the satellite was gradually brought together. You can see there in color um, the uh, modules inside. The modules look more or less like this. This is actually a later module, but it's more or less the same size, made of the same material. Um, and uh, there were pairs of these boxes, um, four to each side of the spacecraft, so, so 16 boxes in total. Basically, a box contained one subsystem of the spacecraft, all clustered around a central box girder, and that took the stresses of launch. So you can see the box girder inside there. Two honeycomb end facets. In fact, the honeycomb is literally this honeycomb, so that thick. Honeycomb is very, very lightweight, but it's also extremely flimsy until you glue two skins to it. As soon as you do that, you get something that's remarkably stiff. This is a solar panel from a later spacecraft, but it's roughly the same size as the solar panels on the USAT spacecraft. This is actually from USAT uh, 5. So there you can see it all coming together and uh, you use the silicon solar cells, about 12% um, efficient uh, in terms of generating power. Now, some of the early testing was done in Martin's car going up and down Guildford High Street. This has become almost like an urban myth, but it's actually true. <laughs> and uh, as you know, Guildford High Street is cobbled. So perfect vibration environment if you stiffen up the uh, suspension. Uh, so that was done. But later we did proper testing courtesy of uh, uh, Stevenage. So uh, BAE at Stevenage did that. And you can see here who was responsible for what. So Martin, of course, looked after the radio systems. Uh, we had uh, Louis Mansi looked after telemetry, Bob Haining data, et cetera. Uh, Christy Sweeting on the navigation magnetometer, Chris Haynes on the microcomputers, Colin Smithers on the HF buildings, and Paul Taylor on the CCD. So there's, a, as you can see, a very small uh, team putting this all together. So every penny counted. There was going to be no more money. And uh, so, you know, we, it, it had to be done as, as, as it was possible. 
It's a tight deadline, but it was made, uh, and uh, the spacecraft was taken over and tested using the magnetic test facility at Goddard. These are gigantic Helmholtz coil, which I believe previously have been used for testing the magnetic signature of the lunar module. And uh, that was done under the auspices of Mario Kuna. And uh, then uh, the spacecraft was taken over to Vandenberg. There you see the team and how small a team it is. And they mated the spacecraft into the Delta launch vehicle. Now, the launch itself for us was free. And that's, you know, the fantastic work that NASA did. They were strong supporters of education. And uh, they offered the launch uh, essentially for no cost. Uh, the launch rocket was going anyway. It was carrying a mission called Solar Mesosphere Explorer. And indeed, the dimensions of USAT-1 were determined by the gap between the second stage guidance ring and the nose cone itself. So there's the nose cone cover, there's little USAT, and there's the second stage guidance ring, and that's Solar Mesosphere Explorer above it. So that was it. It was put on a special shelf that was um, uh, designed by McDonnell Douglas. And, and you know, it, it, again, credit to them, because it doesn't enhance the safety of the launch of this very expensive scientific satellite to have some other satellites sticking underneath it. But um, anyway, they did that. And when the rocket was launched, it was a night launch, actually. Um, it's a Delta 2310 uh, rocket. Um, the main payload, the Solar Mesosphere Explorer, was uh, deployed, and then just using a, a clamp band uh, locked with a, um, a, a cut uh, bolt, a, a sort of pyro cut bolt, the uh, uh, spring pushed the USAT-1 off into space. And that actually all worked perfectly. And USAT-1 was deployed into sun synchronous orbit to give you a scale. I've got my little planet Earth here. It's going round more or less over the poles, just slightly tilted with respect to the poles. And it's roughly the width of my thumb high on this scale. So that's, that's where low Earth orbit is for this particular spacecraft. So it was uh, 342 nautical miles high. Americans still work in miles and feet and seconds and inches, um, about 500 kilometers high. So there's the ground station at that time. And you can see, uh, you know, the computers are basically hand built. Uh, the data were recorded on audio tape and processed with the universities. I think the university only had one computer, had a, a prime uh, mainframe computer for processing things. Um, it was uh, commanded by uh, a team, including Neville Bean, who sadly passed away um, uh, two years ago now. And he was the longest serving member of S SSC, SSTL, uh, other than Martin. So it's uh, a sad loss. So USAC carried this camera. Uh, the first attempt at getting a picture sadly didn't work, but on the second attempt it did. And we got this famous picture of Corsica and Sardinia. So there's the picture. It's a little noisy, but that's what you'd expect. And of course, it's rather black and white because it is only a four-bit camera. Uh, but there's Corsica and Sardinia just to show it's true. And uh, uh, that was a fantastic sight uh, to get. Now, that was done on a camera not too dissimilar to this. This is the next generation of CCD. And by the way, that's the, the camera chip itself. All that is the drive electronics <laughs> that's needed just to make that chip work. Um, the problem was for USAT is the gravity gradient boom that was to stabilize the spacecraft uh, was deploying. But then uh, I think possibly Stephen Hodgett noticed <laughs> that the magnetic field of the Earth apparently did a 180 degree flip. So obviously that didn't happen. It meant that the boom must have done a 180 degree flip. So the cable must have snagged and it bent uh, over. The tape uh, boom, by the way, is a tape. It's really not much stronger than aluminum foil. Uh, and it was deployed out with a sort of kilogram or so on the end of it. So um, unfortunately, it only went out a little way. It wasn't enough to gravity gradient stabilize the spacecraft. So essentially, the spacecraft would tumble around a bit. And so when we took a picture, you couldn't tell whether you were pointing down or up. So there's the ground station uh, slightly later time. Um, unfortunately, at one stage, uh, a command was sent which, which turned on both transmitters, both the VHF and UHF transmitter, which meant that the UHF and the VHF receiver couldn't hear ground commands because it was deafened by its own transmissions. Remember, it's all on the same antenna. But fortunately, uh, friends at Stanford were able to use this enormous radio astronomy dish 
uh, with 3 million watts of EIRP, <laughs> 3 megawatts of effective isotropic radiative power, they were able to send the command basically saying, turn off, and uh, it duly did, and uh, we were then able to re recover. And by the way, that was an important lesson, so USAT 2, it was just not physically possible to command both transmitters on at the same time. Now, one of the neat features of USAT 1 and indeed USAT 2 is it carried a voice synthesizer. Uh, well, actually, it's a sort of digital recording of a voice called, uh, out of this toy, Speak and Spell. I should have brought it along. I've got one of these in my office. Uh, it used a Texas chip called Digitalker, and it could speak a few hundred words of vocabulary, and so it could actually speak. And so it was really easy for school children to pick up because with a little VHF radio, you could hear this voice coming down from space. The digital data was transmitted also using audio tones, a technique known as audio frequency shift keying. So you have one tone representing a one, second tone representing a zero. And it used the Bell 202 uh, standard, and that could be transmitted on any of the radio beacons. And there you can see actually a picture of the uh, famous dish uh, at Surrey receiving the signal on the Yagi antennas there. So there's Martin celebrating uh, the anniversary of USAT-1 a little time ago. Uh, it uh, re-entered the Earth's atmosphere after eight years in orbit. It worked up to the point of re-entry. Uh, Friday the 13th of October 1989, it came in and burnt up over the Indian Ocean. And it was transmitting to the end. This is uh, one of the transmissions. That's the digital data. You, the nice thing about audio frequency shift keying is you can instantly tell what it's actually doing by just listening to it. <laughs> now, Digitalker, this is Digitalker. It's an American voice that's been digitized. Etc. Now, I was at Scarborough as a school teacher in those days, listening to that, <laughs> writing it all down very carefully. Uh, it, that one, of course, was, was actually saying what the values were. It, if you hear, heard it, it was saying the temperatures in degrees C. Uh, but we used to write down the telemetry because it could speak the telemetry. And in one pass over Scarborough, one 10 minute pass, you get one frame <laughs> of telemetry. <laughs> and we think this is just fantastic. And then later it would transmit the digital data. And that was really annoying because we had no means of decoding it until <laughs> until I sat down and wrote, wrote some code to do it. But uh, it was a fantastic uh, achievement, absolutely brilliant achievement. And NASA were extremely impressed. And in fact, that's why they came back to us with the offer for another launch, and that's led to USAT 2. So now I want to introduce how I got involved in all this. I, of course, uh, 10 years younger than Martin, so I grew up in the 60s uh, and was also influenced by the space program and things like Jerry Anderson's, you know, Thunderbirds and stuff like that, still great today. And Concorde was Britain's big aerospace project, of Britain and France, of course. And in fact, Neil Armstrong said that Concorde was more difficult than landing on the moon. Uh, and I gave a lecture on that the other day. It is actually a remarkable aircraft, or was a remarkable aircraft. But anyway, um, it was that sort of excitement. We got Kennedy in 1961 uh, announcing this aim to get onto the moon before the decade is out. And uh, I was interested in astronomy. I used to do astronomy from the back garden with a pair of binoculars and things like that. So it was sort of that milieu that I grew up with. I also was extremely lucky because I went to a comprehensive college, Burley Community College. We had a very progressive education system in Leicestershire. It was all very, in fact, we had counters <laughs> where the kids were basically let to do whatever they wanted to do. Bolly wasn't quite as bad as that. But anyway, we had a computer terminal 
linked to County Hall in Leicester, about uh, 20 miles away, and it had a phone modem. And you could phone up this computer, put the phone on a hook, and then you could um, program or send a program to the computer using the uh, terminal and uh, store your programs on punch paper tape. So myself and a couple of friends, uh, we decided that we would uh, ask the teachers if they would let us have a go at this thing. And uh, they did, foolish then. And uh, they let us um, go out and actually teach ourselves to program. So I taught, taught myself to program in BASIC using the original book by Kemlin Kurtz, who invented the BASIC language. As I was coming to leave uh, school, uh, coming up into the 78-79, uh, um, Sir Sinclair produced the ZX80 and then the ZX81. And so this was amazing for relatively low cost. I mean, it was still extraordinarily expensive, you know, sort of 200 pounds, nearly 300 pounds. You could buy a computer. Wasn't that amazing? And you could actually program this thing. So I decided to study computer science and physics at university. So I did a joint degree. It was supposed to be two thirds physics and one third computer science, but it ended up as two thirds of each. <laughs> and uh, I'd, right from a child, actually, from about the age of five, I'd had a sort of very long term vision, uh, you know, sort of a, a, a ambition to be a teacher. But I didn't want to do a teaching degree, I wanted to do something technical. So when I was at York, I found out that, oh, you could do this thing called a PGC on top of your degree, and then that would qualify you to teach. So I did that. And then, again, really luckily, just as I was ready to graduate from that, uh, a job came up uh, at Scarborough, which is not very far from York, and uh, that was in a sixth form college. And I thought, yeah, that would suit me very well, because I had a half an eye of thinking about teaching in further or higher education, and sixth form could be a step towards that. So I went for interview and got the job and I became a physics, maths, games and all sorts of other things teacher <laughs> at uh, Scarborough. Uh, meanwhile, Martin had arranged with the NatWest Bank, I believe, to have this booklet, in fact, this very booklet, uh, sent to every sixth form in the country. And it said all about USAT1 and how to decode it, how to pick it up and what they'd done and everything is brilliant. And so my boss at the time, Chris Case, head of department said, uh, do something with that Underwood. So we did. Um, with my colleague, uh, Eric, uh, Eric Toos, we uh, decided to uh, build up a little ground station using actually the plan that's in here. We use welding rods and a bit of wood to make a cross dipole. And because um, uh, I could program the BBC Micro, uh, I was able to buy a, a BBC Micro. In fact, I got credit cards in order to do so. And then... Um, I could actually program them in assembly and get the cassette port interface to decode the data. So I worked on that. My colleague Eric worked on the tracking software, and we produced something called SatPack, which we made available through AMSAT. And then uh, David Duff from uh, Unilab uh, got in contact. David had pioneered using weather satellites and things in education and uh, said, well, why don't we put together a kit of uh, receivers for NOAA, uh, the weather satellites, and for USAT, and use the SATPAC software that Eric and I had written. And in fact, uh, Steve there is suddenly also no longer with us, with Astrid, used the same software. So this meant that schools could get a key piece of kit, they could easily track the spacecraft and actually decode the data. So that's kind of where I came in. And indeed, this is the brochure. I was looking at the prices. They're unbelievable <laughs> by today's standards. Uh, so they, there's all the information inside them. So meanwhile, NASA had come back to Martin and said, uh, you know, would you like another go? They were very impressed with the first one. And of course, Martin said yes. And then the bad news, you've got six months. <laughs> so, wow. The first one had taken sort of 30 months or so. Six months was going to be virtually impossible. If anyone was sane, they'd say, oh, that's a shame, we can't do it. But Martin, of course, said, yes, we'll go for it. <laughs> and uh, by the simple expedient of not sleeping and just working every possible hour, the team, the new team, actually, was able to put together a second satellite. It looks very similar to USAT-1, but it really isn't. A lot of lessons were learned from USAT-1, so that fed into the design of USAT-2. USAT-2, to be honest, is a much better satellite, but it's also a much more sophisticated satellite. In fact, USAT-2 pioneered uh, communication techniques 
that now all of us use because it carried a system for store and forward communication. That is, you could compose anything, any message digitally, transmit it to the spacecraft, store it on board, and then download that message anywhere else in the world. Now, sending a digital message somewhere else in the world, haven't we heard about that? Isn't it nowadays called email? And this was before email existed. So that was pioneered by USAT, and uh, USAT 2 carried the first of those systems, and then it was further developed in the other USATs too. It was launched again by Delta. McDonnell Douglas did a great job, and NASA did a great job, again out of Vandenberg Air Force Base, this time on a slightly bigger um, Delta rocket. Here you can see the spacecraft coming together. It was done in amazing uh, short time, but it was done. It was all properly tested, etc. You can see Martin there in, in the thermal vacuum chamber, um, the vibration testing. And uh, Dave Brock there, and Neville, Christine, and Richard Macbeth working away. Um, the concept was going to be broadly similar to USAT 1, so supporting space education, pioneering these new techniques like store and forward communication through the digital communication experiment. That was um, pioneered by Harold Price, uh, Jeff Ward, and Larry Kayser uh, in the United States. Jeff actually came to work at USAT. In fact, he joined, I think, in mid-85 as I came down in 86. So um, it used the NSC 800, a sort of CMOS version of a Z80. It had 128K of memory. I can't tell you how much memory that was back then. You know, We thought 64K was an enormous amount of memory. You could never possibly fill it. Uh, it also used AFSK for its uh, communications, and it also had a digital uh, on board. And lots and lots of, of commercial off-the-shelf chips, as we now call them. Uh, memory chips particularly. It also had the 1802 as the primary computer, and it was programmed in a high-level language. <laughs> uh, the first satellites were programmed in assembly, uh, so right down at raw level. But this was programmed in a language called Forth, which none of you will have heard of. <laughs> Forth is a stacked-based language. It, so in other words, it's, it, it, the logic fits a computer's brain, but not a human one. Uh, so you push data and you pop it off the stack and all sorts of things. But we had Steve Holder uh, later who, who was uh, programming in fourth. I think originally it uh, was um, the German chap, wasn't it, who, uh, who developed that first, first off. Um, and uh, we had uh, uh, some experiments from other universities. I think Kent provided a space dust detector, sort of pre-Giotto uh, mission space dust detector. And Sussex provided a, what they called a particle wave experiment, looking at the ionosphere and looking at, at um, electrons in the ionosphere and things like that. It was also gravity gradient stabilized. This time it worked because we didn't put a magnetometer in the end of the boom. Uh, and uh, uh, it proved to be a, a, a great success. Uh, again, it used the canted turnstile technique and it could, with its computer, it could do more sophisticated things with the data on board. So it could actually sample its own telemetry and put it together in what we used to call whole orbit data. So we could then see data that wasn't recorded live as it passed over Guildford. So we could see what it's been doing throughout the whole orbit, hence whole orbit data. There you see some plots of the magnetometer data. You can see the, uh, um, the z-axis plot there in the top uh, left corner. That's basically showing you the number of orbits. So there's one to two and a half orbits there. Uh, you can see the higher spin on the x-axis, that's because it's rotating around the boom in what we call barbecue mode, run, once every 10 minutes. That gives it a nice even roasting in the sunshine. And you can see the battery uh, nice and flat topped in sunlight because it's fully charged. And then you see as we go into eclipse, the battery voltage dips down and things like that. Again, system diagram, it's not a simple spacecraft. Uh, there's quite a lot in it, including CCD cameras. Sadly, the camera on this one uh, was never very successful, so we did, we don't get very nice pictures. But it was launched in daytime, and for the first and only time, it was carried live by BBC TV. <laughs> and I was actually in Scarborough watching this on TV, uh, little realising that I would get more involved uh, later. But it was very exciting to see the launch. Again, you can see how tight fit it was into the nose cone. This time it's Landsat D prime, Landsat 5, as it became, uh, was the main mission. Now, this is the... Uh, this is a video taken, uh, it's been converted many times from American standard to UK standard, so it's a bit grainy, but uh, have a look at it. I think it must capture the spirit of the, of the times. <laughs> Put 
put together by Harold Price. If you listen, he said, you are sat B. That's because in those days, we used to name them A, B, C, and then if they successfully got to orbit, rename them one, two, three. <laughs> it was a common thing in the 60s to do that. VITA, by the way, is a, um, an organization that is voluntary aid to you know, developing countries and things like that, and the Storm Forward system was supported by, by them. So... So, uh, I just think that's an amazing video. You notice how much work was being done just before launch, and that's because I think nothing quite worked until the very last minute. Uh, and actually, just watching that, it reminded me of a, of a title of a recent space biography called Never Panic Ernie, <laughs> <laughs> which I think is very appropriate. Uh, anyway, it worked fine. Um, Martin, Mr. Cool, uh, you know, not, not panicking. Working the problem, that's what good engineers do until it works. 
So, uh, 1985 then, I'd been teaching for a couple of years. I enjoyed teaching, actually. Uh, but uh, we saw in the back of, Eric and I saw in the back of um, New Scientist an uh, advert to come down to Surrey. So we thought, well, that might be interesting. So we came down, had an interview with Martin and Roger Peel, actually, and um, uh, got the job, although it was very hard to find out what the job actually was. <laughs> but, uh, it seemed to be a bit of everything. But it was sort of working on uh, satellites in education, which obviously fitted exactly what I've been doing, uh, because I could program. It was also about developing a ground station for Pakistan, uh, trying to get uh, the BBC to talk to this horrible thing called Torch, which is an Z80 co-processor. Uh, and um, later, because of course I'm a physicist, <laughs> uh, I got involved in some of the more physicky aspects of spacecraft design, like uh, looking at the thermal design, uh, that, that was to come later. But uh, initially, actually, with working with Jeff, was to look at the effects of the space environment on all those memory chips, of which we have many. So that's how I came down. That is me in 1986, the trendy teacher. Notice the pet computer, by the way. That was the uh, first sort of microcomputer there. So, um, indeed, we, I trained lots of teachers. We had a, I set up something called the National Resource Center for Satellites in Education that was very grand, but it was me. Uh, and for most of that time, it was me in a corridor with a curtain. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and uh, I sort of wrote documents and things, uh, including um, the booklet for USAT 2 and uh, lots of these um, papers and, and sort of leaflets to, to uh, schools and colleges. And uh, here you can see uh, Bob <laughs> and uh, myself, rather younger version. Uh, we're actually in the room next to the lift shaft because I think this must have been when we were converting the ground station to IBM PCs. So we temporarily moved to, the, to this lift shaft and, and put the BBCs in there. But uh, you see the sort of equipment that, uh, that schools had. Now, Bob very kindly, through the auspices of Martin, has uh, recorded uh, USAT 2 uh, just on the 10th of March. So this is 40 years on from then. This is what a frame of telemetry looks like when you've sort of decoded it, but it's actually transmitted like this. And that's because there are checksums in there. So I wrote some very nifty um, code to check the checksums and then repair it if it's if it's wrong. Came to me in the bath. <laughs> uh, if you listen, you'll hear a da 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 the da da bit is the USAT two of the of the time and date. That's what that is. And then the da 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 are the lines of telemetry. There are sixty analog channels and there are eight digital channels in there. And uh, this is what it sounds like. If I can, yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. Thanks for that, Bob. <laughs> uh, it brings back so many happy memories, I can tell you. Ah, yes, satellites in education. So that's there's a boys from the Royal Grammar School, the local grammar school. That's a USAT module there. I'm showing them. And a nice model of USAT 2. Um, sort of scale, but not quite full size scale. Uh, that was put together by NASA uh, in tribute to Martin and the team for the fantastic work that they did on these uh, spacecraft and well deserved too. Now, we did something really fun. There was this team, there they are, who rather strangely decided they would ski from Russia to Canada <laughs> via the North Pole, as you do. And we got involved because they needed to know where they were. Navigating at high latitude is not easy. You know, compasses don't work, etc. Pre-GPS. So how do they know where they are? Well, there are satellites called COSPASARSAT, run by USSR and USA, by Russia and America. And they pick up emergency signals from ships at sea that are sinking and aircraft that are down. So they carried emergency location transmitter. These COSPASARSATs, as they fly by, pick up those signals, and from the Doppler shift, they work out where that signal is coming from on the ground. So Moscow would work out where they were, and they would send us a, a telex, <laughs> no internet, so they would send us a telex saying where they were. We would program DigitalCA to say where they were, 
And then as they skied along, they could use a handheld radio to listen to where they were. <laughs> and so lots of schools could follow them. And you'll see the track. They went all the way to the North Pole. When they got to the North Pole, they had a bit of a party where the press flew in. And one of my colleagues, Martin, um, Michael Meerman, uh, actually flew out. He, he was another operator in the USAC control room. He flew out and actually went to the North Pole uh, with his KGB minder, who he later married. And, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> uh, so it was happy all, all round. And um, then they flew back and left, left the ski trek party to ski all the way to Canada, which they, they duly did. And uh, it was an amazing thing, 1988. And uh, this, is, this is what it sounded like. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Etc. Etc. So as it went round, if you could hear what it was saying, it was given the date and the time. That was when the fix was made, and it gave their position uh, in degrees and minutes n, which was north, and degrees and minutes e, which was east. Of course, so that was a position. And there's the track as they ski. It was pretty straight, wasn't it? It's a long way <laughs> uh, over the poles, but. Loads of schools around the world listened to that, and they could follow the, the path of this 1988 ski trek party. So that was amazing uh, to, uh, to do that. Now, um, Jeff Ward and myself got a... Well, actually, Martin got the contract, but Jeff Ward and I were the people that were made to work on it, uh, to, uh, with ESA, to look at the effects of space radiation on the chips that we were flying. Because we were flying what people nowadays call commercial off-the-shelf technology, Everyone said, you're completely crazy. There's no way this stuff is going to work in space, but it did. And the team who designed the two USATs had worked out that there would be effects from radiation, including single event upsets, and they had uh, mitigated those through techniques called, called error detection and correction coding. And as a result of those coding uh, techniques, we could tell when a bit flipped. And from when it flipped, we knew where the spacecraft was, so we could map it out. So because I'd written the software for doing all the tracking, I could then map out where these errors were. And Jeff and I worked on that. And that's the result when you look at all the errors, of which there are thousands. And you see there's a big black patch over the South Atlantic. It's called the South Atlantic Anomaly. And this, I think, really was the first discovery that the South Atlantic anomaly has a big impact on modern microelectronics. NASA had big, sort of started to see problems, but they, they were focused very much on heavy ion cosmic rays as being the source of problems. They hadn't thought about the trapped protons in the Van Allen belts, and that's what was causing that effect. And then the stuff that you see near the poles, that is from solar particles, sort of raining down the magnetic field lines. So um, that was a major breakthrough, actually. And in fact, it, it started my PhD research, which uh, uh, I completed at Surrey over six years part time. When I launched, uh, well, when we launched USAT 3, it carried a payload put together by Farnborough called Credo. And my task was to kind of integrate it and, and analyze the data from that. And so I was then able to get actual radiation data, which you see in the inset plot, and compare that to the upset data. And you can see that when there's a spike on the uh, radiation data, we get a spike in the SEUs as well. And those were some particularly big flares. In fact, 1989, as you can see, October 89 there, September and October 89, was one of the biggest flares ever. In fact, the September 89 flare took out the uh, national grid or most of the national grid of Canada. Um, so it was a major event. Our spacecraft survived it. The USAT-2 survived it. But, uh, of course, the error counters went haywire. In fact, they probably wrapped around. There probably were even more errors than that. Uh, you can see the effects when you plot it on these globes. Uh, the, the 
South Atlantic anomaly shows up all the time, but when the sun is active, you get that little sort of bright patch of particles over the polar regions. The big black hole, by the way, is nothing sinister. It's just we never fly over that area. Um, so I was then able to, um, you know, through the magic of the Kulwane BL space, plot out where these particles were. You could see the Van belts clearly delineated, and then how the whole Earth lights up when it's uh, being attacked by solar particles and the effects on SEUs. So that was where I got my PhD, doing that sort of research. So USAT 1, USAT 2 were phenomenal successes. We'd love to carry on, what we wanted to carry on, but how do you afford to do it? There wasn't time to get the money for USAT 2, apart from going to the university and kind of begging it. Uh, and so I think the university was able to stump up half a million pounds, which is a lot of money, uh, but <laughs> on the very sound basis that they needed paying back. And so how do you pay the university back? Well, Martin decided to set up a company, to SSTL, and through that company, market our know-how, market our technology to the rest of the world, and then use that as, a, as an income revenue stream, also supporting research and supporting the development of the space technology. A brilliant concept, actually, because it made it a sustainable program. And at the time, the UK had no interest in space. It's, it's very typical of our political classes, who honestly aren't engineers, to say, space, well, yeah, how many satellites does the world need? Three? <laughs> the Americans can do that. You know, if we need anything, we'll buy it in. Um, so there was just no real interest. There was no space agency then. Um, and, of course, the Britain's own rocket programme, Black Arrow, which worked perfectly and was beautiful, uh, was even cancelled before it was launched. So the scientists had to beg to be allowed to launch it, which it did, and it launched Prospero, which is still up there and still transmits sometimes in sun sunlight. So um, that's the kind of regime that we're in. It was obvious that if we were going to do anything, it had to be with overseas countries. And uh, so that was the, the mission there. So Martin, with just £100, uh, started off the company SSTL, uh, and through SSTL, the USAT unit was able to work with uh, teams coming in from other countries to provide those uh, customers effectively with training, what we called KHTT, know-how technology transfer uh, training. And this um, enabled us to afford to do our research, but it also worked really well uh, conceptually as, as a model because it meant that all the academics were very strongly industrially focused so our research is very focused on real problems, real world problems, and also thinking about the, the far future. And it meant that SSTL had access to all these academics, so they could exploit that research and that technology, and indeed they could offer that to their customers. So it just worked synergistically for all of us. So we got benefit as academics, and SSTL got benefit uh, as a company. So it was a, a, a fantastic concept, I think unique, actually. And so that was the position after USAT 2, as we went from into the late 80s, and we went into the USAT 3, USAT 4, USAT 5 sort of era, but that's another story. Uh, there's the group. There's uh, USAT with Martin there in the front, the model that used to be in the library. Uh, myself, Keith Fisher, Jeff Ward, Richard Macbeth, uh, and, uh, and so on. Uh, Tim's still around, the, the young lad on the end there is still around. Uh, Slim, as we used to call him, Martin then is still around. And I'm sure the others are probably around somewhere. And I love the picture that uh, it must have been Martin who put it together. <laughs> no? Somebody anyway put it together. This is pre-Photoshop, so it was literally done by cutting out bits of paper. <laughs> but there's the famous Star Trek picture, but you'll notice all the faces have been changed. Who needs AI? Well, as we say, the rest is history, of course. Uh, what Martin started, you know, 45 years ago now, the world has just caught up with him. And they call it Space 2.0. And as Monty was telling me before we started the talk, you know, the young engineers think, wow, this is brilliant. Small satellites started five years ago. <laughs> no, they started 10 times further back than that, 45 years ago. It's been a fantastic experience uh, for us to work on that. Where else could you possibly have worked on so many space missions to have such opportunity to... Uh, 
um, get stuff flown in space. It's just brilliant. And uh, to um, work in these teams, to work internationally, um, it's been a wonderful experience. It's something that I do recommend to the students in the audience. A career in space, not something I ever thought I would go into, but here, here I am. Um, it's been a fantastic career, taking me all the way around the world, met thousands of people from all sorts of different countries and cultures, and worked on all sorts of technically challenging problems. In fact, still working on technically challenging aren't I, Nick? <laughs> <laughs> Which, uh, you know, uh, it, it, it just uh, keeps you going, basically. So uh, with that, thank you very much, and thank you for listening. Well, thank you very much, Craig, for you know offering to do the talk today. I mean, yeah. extremely fascinating, very, very interesting. Good. I don't know if it's all right to open up the floor yes, for questions please. at all, um, if anyone has any. Anyone who has any questions, please feel free to ask. I'm sure the light's on as well. I can't see you, of course. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's better. Have a formalized uh, job description or <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm sure on those annual reports there's a job description, but no, I mean, in, everyone had to do everything. When we started, the engineers did, you know, the, the sort of buying the specifications, the building, everything. And it was uh, another thing that's been interesting is see the dynamics of a company as it grows. So, uh, you know, Nelson talked about the Band of Brothers. It really was a family. Until you got to about 25, 30 people, and then it starts to break up a bit, and then you have to start to have more formal methods and you start to say, well, this, this person will be in charge of procurement, this person will look at inspection and so on. So it sort of grows through that. I think Martin used to say that a company either grows or dies, so you've got to grow. Uh, and we got to, I think it was about 300 when we sold it, something of that order. Um, uh, and of course, we sold at a very interesting time 2008 just before the financial crash it was perfect timing <laughs> so we did we as a university i'm talking about now did very well out of it of course the research part uh, the uh, sports part was funded through that um so uh, and they said at the time and i i found this hard to believe that the sstl would double in size and it did so that was uh, amazing So within the academic side, we've done our own missions now, uh, all based around CubeSats. And uh, we did a joint CubeSat mission, the first British CubeSat mission, it turns out, uh, with the SSTL called Strand. And um, that was an interesting uh, exercise. But Strand developed a lot of technology, including a guidance system, which became a commercial product, not out of Surrey, but actually out of Stellenbosch, because we worked with South Africa on that. And... Um, uh, that led to Alsat Mod Nano, which again was done in, in collaboration with SSTL because it was part of the training exercise. Alsat 1N was for Algeria, uh, but it was paid for by the UK government. But the quid pro quo was that it would fly British payloads. So it was an open call and three entities. One, uh, Oxford Space Systems with their boom, first for their booms. Um, Swansea University with their thin film cellar cells. I also worked on, and uh, the Open University with their camera, so they got that flown, and that was a great mission. And then we were working on missions that were to do with debris mitigation, and uh, Inflate Sail was the, the first of those. That was the first demonstration of a European drag sail causing a satellite to re-enter. It came down in 72 days uh, successfully, and I acted as PI at the end of that program to make that happen. Um, and then a fantastic mission again with SSTL, removed debris, which showed active removal using the harpoon and the net to capture uh, targets, to look at them with LIDAR and do all those um, demonstrations in orbit. So that has given us a, a good footing. Um, unfortunately, for us, Brexit happened, and that meant that, that these big programs that were funded through the EU were no longer available to us. But now, fortunately, they're back. Horizon is back which is a good thing. But um, in recent times, we've been working with the UK Space Agency on some very nice concepts and with the European Space Agency. So VMMO is a mission to the moon, creeps up mission to the moon, which we hope will 
go into phase B, fingers crossed, any day now. We did the phase A study, and that was successful. Uh, Nicola and I are very keen to get to the moon, as indeed Martin is. <laughs> uh, and um, uh, the other one is meson, which is to use the moon as an occulting disk to look at the solar cro corona. And uh, there's this fantastic orbit, if we can achieve it, <laughs> which enables you to spend a long time in the, in the shadow of the moon and to look at the sun for a long time. This, and you could do that every month, uh, which would be a fantastic opportunity scientifically. So um, we're working with scientists in the UK, uh, America, Australia, Japan, I think. There's, you know, it's really cool. So exciting times ahead. And there are students in the audience who are working on what we mysteriously call Project X, coming out of the stag works. It's all ultra secret. But watch this space. There might be a spacecraft. <laughs> that, that's the Space Technology Advancement Group, you understand. <laughs> Nothing to do with the university's logo. <laughs> yeah. Does that mission have any involvement with the space? Well, surprise. Actually, with Martin, we saw a picture of you up in the Tinnigan ground station. We're very curious to know if there was any link between it and... Well, funnily enough, I was wondering whether Martin might have founded ears. Did you? No, no, no it existed. Well, I mean, it's rather frightening to think, but I was used to be sitting in the back of this lecture theatre a few years ago, <laughs> and I should have been listening to... doodling, you know, on how to build the next spacecraft. And, uh, yeah, I mean, there were a lot of, there was a close involvement with the years throughout the campaign of the early uh, Oscar spacecraft and right the way through that whole process. And, and then when the spacecraft itself, I don't think there was that much, although a number of the people that were involved in it were also members of years. So uh, we've got some early years photos before they uh, actually <laughs> dig out. You know, and these days. Fantastic. I do, just, you remember, sorry, sorry. You know the um, the HFB. Uh, yeah. That was done in the days before health and safety. And the the aerials were mounted on a on a pole, and then they had to be mounted you know, halfway up on the rotator. And we did that on just before Christmas Eve. We were having a departmental Christmas party at the Grand Four o'clock in the afternoon, and we were struggling to try and get these aerials up. We couldn't quite reach them. So I was on that, up on that tower, standing on a ladder. <laughs> there was a big, burly guy standing on the ladder. I was standing on his shoulders, <laughs> no harness, no railings, four o'clock on the December 24th or whatever it was, whilst everybody else was partying in the park. Watching us. <laughs> 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 it's a different time. Absolutely. It's brilliant. <laughs> yeah. Amazingly. Uh, uh, yeah. Nicola. Yeah, yeah, I was going to ask you, like, yeah. what's the perspective of these new space stations? Like, what's the perspective of these new space stations? Now, the people are targeting the I think that's an interesting question. I mean, in a sense, it's much easier now. Not had to invent all this stuff, but now you can buy a CubeSat. You know, you can buy all the systems, so it makes life a lot easier. So access to space, of course, is much more regular. Of course, USAT 1 and 2 needed this special thing done by McDonnell Douglas. You know, thanks to them for doing that. It was only with the Ariane ASAP ring that there was a regular access to space. And you can see that very clearly when you look at the numbers of small satellites uh, launched. And today... They can be launched by the dozen or hundreds, even. Would they let you do the testing? Uh, yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, it's, actually, sorry, it's yeah. an interesting point because it's easier to buy the bits now. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, regulation. Mm. There's clearly a lot more regulation. When we launched USA 1, the UK had no laws associated. That's going to require one. So it was after we launched the USA One that they created the Outer Space Act for Parliament to be required. And uh, so now you have the regulatory hurdle, which isn't huge, but it costs a little bit of money and it takes some time. And having to do this is necessary. And then 
uh, the launch agencies are quite tricky because, uh, in terms of their requirements, because they're dealing with a very wide, wide range of potential customers coming along. So, particularly SpaceX is increasing the requirements on the technical safety of spacecraft uh, as they get more and more experience with wider groups of people, and, and the bar just gets higher because everyone that comes along with a, you know, a bad spacecraft doesn't want to stop that, so they raise it up. So, there's a little bit of a hurdle that way. But then there's different methods of launching. In many ways, it's much easier, but there are some different things to try to do. I wonder if it was... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, Martin, I wonder if it's because many of those early AMSAT people were, in fact, rocket engineers working for companies like, like McDonnell Douglas, that people had a more laissez-faire attitude in those days, or, you know, or more supportive attitude, let's say. Sounds apocryphal, but it's true. And McDonnell Douglas, they came along and they said, Right, here's the documentation. And it was literally. And I looked at it and I said, Well, we have a choice. We can either build the satellite or we can read the documentation. <laughs> and they sort of, yeah, oh, yeah, all right. I said, Well, you know, why don't you tell us what we really, really need to do? <laughs> I said, fine, yeah, yeah, we'll stick with that. But I think the key is that, and this is in the late 70s, I suppose, and with all those people working in NASA and at McDonnell Douglas who were working on the moon missions, yeah. the Apollo missions, and Apollo finished, and they were sort of, you know, thinking, well, it's a little bit boring now. Uh, so when you've got the Soviet Big Thing, they went to get the homemade satellite, they went to stick it in the backside of your very expensive rocket. Yeah, I said, well, yeah, why not? You know, let's have that fun. And so they, you know, they came in here with that sort of spirit. And so when we said, no, we can't do that, let's find out what we really need. Um, and on the rocket, you know, uh, Craig showed you USAT 2 really yes. tight in yeah. the launcher envelope. And we, when we actually got to the launch site, we found it didn't fit. So what they did is they got a big hammer and they said, well, what we'll do is we'll put a, an RF window in the fairing still didn't fit. So then they got a big mallet and just banged a dent in, in the bearing of the rocket in order that we could get in with sufficient clearance so they wasn't going to hit it. Those were the days when you could have a, a bit more of a conservative approach. Yeah, yeah. I understand that they don't do it. How much? How much time? You use that too. It was exactly six months. Yeah. Actually, the, some of those, the, in, in the video, you see us working. They were literally, we were still completing, build, well, I was still completing building the, the uh, telecommand receivers, and NASA was banging on the door saying, we want you on the rocket. And we were still doing the final bits to make it actually work. Bit of a tight close thing. No yeah. pressure. Just, just in time. <laughs> just in time. And how much time did you do? that one, it was probably about two and a half years, but yeah. that you know, really, I suspect, the actual building was about a year and a half. I mean, to be honest, it was a, a pretty a uh, brave thing for the university to do to a, let us do it in the first one and secondly to fund the second one um, and i think it, it was because sorry it was a new university at the time they didn't have any history didn't have any reputation to lose you know, a lot of people, all the academics had come from industry nearly all the academics had come from industry or back to polytechnic mm -hmm. And they said, yeah, yeah, why not? So there was the opportunity to do these new things. I think it would be very, very difficult to do that today. In the same way. In the same, yeah, absolutely impossible in my view. Yeah, it was six months yeah. from the day they rang up and they said, you've got to be there. Yeah. And, and as our working times, by the way, we started at seven in the morning and we finished. And the biggest challenge was to learn how to sleep yeah. for those four hours. 
when you've been working away on things since all going round and round. Yes. And you know you've got to get up, you know, again. You have to learn how to meditate. Look at the last you know, yes. the picture of the people at the launch site. They look like yeah. <laughs> for good reason. <laughs> it was, to be honest, it was still the same on your side, three and four. We, uh, anyone who worked on that will know. Um, I think in one week I had six hours of sleep in the week. Um, we used to work until uh, nearly the closing time of the student union bar, go down, have a pint, come out and <laughs> carry on <laughs> and work through the night. And in fact, at the time, uh, we were watching CNN on TV because it was the Gulf War period. And so we were watching that go on while we were building a satellite that would later uh, take images of that region. It was, uh, well, for example, to stack up USAT 3 and 4, which, you know, would take a day to, to do that, sort of 20 hours to do it. Uh, until I think uh, on I think it might have been post that we discovered that if you laid it on its side, you could do it in two hours. <laughs> 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 so, you know, you learn, you, you learn as you go, exactly. Yeah. And uh, that's the other lesson because um, I've seen now as go through on the academic side, we went through uh, Snap and then uh, we lost all our capability. We then regained it with Strand but everyone had to learn the lessons again. So it was the strand was not perfect by any means, but the next one was much, much better. And the third one was fantastic. Um, and, uh, you know, you can't, you can't teach this stuff out of a book. You've got to do it and then you'll learn. And it's not something you can pass on very easily without actually working alongside people who are experienced. And that's why we have the programs mm. with, I think, in nearly 20 different countries now, mm. where they you know, send over a team for well, at least a year, usually it's two years, and then they work alongside our team and through that process where they are part of the team. So they learn the management, they learn the procurement, the technology, tracking everything firsthand, and that, that's the most effective way to, mm. to gain that experience. No doubt. And hey, if you look at it, I think last time we counted six of the new space agencies, yeah. mm. the nucleus of those space agencies, Malaysia, China, Nigeria, Nigeria, Chile, were all trained here by coming and working on the space for a couple of years and going back to the new national space agency. Yeah. And, the, and the great thing is, we're still in touch with some of these people yeah. and we still work with, with, uh, with colleagues you know, with Nigeria and China. Yeah. So it's really, I mean, it, it, it's a nice relationship to have where you have that collaboration. Yes. When you were building a satellite, how much of your work was and how much was just collaborating? How much was how, how much? I don't remember reading much through manuals, <laughs> <laughs> to be honest. I don't think the manuals were written. No, yeah, I don't think the writings are going on. I mean, there was, as I mentioned, there was the documentation we had to do for the launch agency to show that the satellite was going to fall apart in the rocket. Uh, I, there weren't, and there wasn't really anywhere you could go. And, you know, it wasn't a, how do you build a satellite? It, 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 it really wasn't like that. And there was always a big debate also about how much should we document as we went, because you can spend an awful lot of time documenting stuff. And that just takes away from actually doing stuff. So one of the techniques we, we developed was rather than write everything down, we photograph. Yeah, yeah. So I was saying to Craig mm -hmm. that in my loft alongside a Last count, 27,000 frames of black and white photos of every single board in all its stages of manufacture. So, if we wanted to know what was a resistor that we used on USAC 3, 
photo system, you go to the photograph and then you would so we did it that way around rather than So in the later USAT I used to photograph all my good old Pentax ME Super. And that came in when I did my PhD because <clears throat> the opportunity retrospectively to get some beam time to expose the chips. And from the photographs, I could get the date code uh, of the chip and the chip number and go to the manufacturer and ask for that IC, that specific batch and that specific date code and test them retrospectively. So um, that was extremely useful. And uh, famously, NASA had a situation where a particular batch of components were faulty, but because they documented so well, they could find every one of them in their spacecraft and replace them. So, uh, yeah, the, in fact, it, later we didn't used to photograph um, as much as we used to, and that was a bit annoying, really, because, you know, it was very useful to actually have that full data that was going on. Mm. The test campaign takes almost as long as film. Oh, yeah. So mm. you said you've managed to get the out of testing, or was it just it goes through the network? No, it has to go through the testing. Uh, you, have to, you have to go through environmental testing. Yeah, I mean, the launch agency, mm. in this case, from Joel Douglas, and mm. NASA wouldn't let us on the rocket yeah. if we hadn't completed the film to test their levels of certification. So that's why the, you know, one of the first ones was driving up and down <laughs> Guildford High Street, which we did at 10 o'clock at night, and there was a certain <laughs> speed, which was a bit under 60 miles an hour. <laughs> 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 and there weren't so many people in Guildford High Street in those days, and they were in the night, the pubs shut at 10.30. So uh, you got, and we had to drive up and down there at just under 60 miles an hour, and then get back before the fuzz arrived. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, somebody would you know, ring the police and say that it's speed. And uh, so, but yeah, that was the screening test. After that, we'd go to either RE in Farnborough or British Aerospace or you know, formal test, mm. and that had to be all documented mm. and a thermal vacuum as well. The big thing is with Landsat, you know, it's a big optical spacecraft. Mm. The last mm. thing they wanted was our spacecraft to outgas and, and to, for that to then deposit on the lens. So they were particularly uh, sensitive about outgassing. So the thermal vacuum test uh, and measured the outgassing of our spacecraft. And it's interesting, on, on, luckily on USAT 1, there wasn't a strict outgassing uh, limit because one day um, before the launch, we turned up into our magnificent clean room, the one next door was made out of big steel rings and solid gear and uh, Hoover running backwards to pressurize it. And we found that the, uh, and this was only a few weeks before. And we'd had an infestation of little red money spiders. Mm. And the spacecraft was just covered in little red money spiders. <laughs> and so we got a little, a little vacuum cleaner, so we hoovered up all the red money spiders that we could find. We I'm absolutely sure yeah. that there was a money spider there. <laughs> <laughs> But I, I, we were having that we chat chat earlier. I, yeah. I did start uh, a, a, a scanner. But then I realized I was in the original time to do that. Fortunately, now with your mobile phone, if you put the frames onto a light bulb and take a picture with your phone, actually the resolution of the camera is equivalent to that. But there's still a lot of work. So, mm. yeah, though they're stored nicely, not. not yeah, but yeah, it is. A, I'm quite sure. <laughs> Big job. Big job. I mean, it's not only yeah. You know, you've got to you've got to digitize them or you scan them, then you've got to break down the frame, and, mm. and that's the bit that takes the time. Yeah. So UK. Uh... <laughs> yeah, yeah. Send some around, stick them in the law. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
a quick question from Fraser online. Uh, he, he says he's apologies that he's missed the talk himself, but his question is: Have Elon Musk or Jeff Bezos come crawling to the University of Surrey or SSTL for any valuable knowledge, or are they standing on the shoulders of Guildford giants? And is it right if I give you the mic as well, Martin, just so people can hear online? Right. Well, um, I haven't had any 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 involvement with Jeff Bezos, but uh, uh, Elon Musk, interestingly. Um, was a, an investor in SSTL for before we sold it to Airbus, and in fact, I I first met Elon, and I forget when it was. Must have been around about the year two thousand when he just made his money on PayPal and uh, and and whatever, uh, and, and he was looking to get into space. And uh, I was in a conference in Colorado, and I, I somebody rang me up and said, "Look, we got this chap here. He wants to put a greenhouse on Mars. He's you know, probably a maniac, but you know, he's got a bit of money. He's just made some money in eBay and and, and so on. Yeah, would you talk to him?" I said, "Yeah, yeah, I'm up for anything. Sounds interesting." Um, so Elon was somewhere in in California, and he had at that time he had a if I remember correctly he had a Mig jet which he bought and he flew that <laughs> down to Colorado Springs uh, and we had breakfast together in Colorado Springs and, and and he said look I want to put a greenhouse on Mars because you know I want to show NASA that it doesn't take ages and untold amounts of money to do this sort of thing I said yeah that sounds a great idea but you know um, I'd love to help uh, how are you going to get there because you know greenhouse you know, not too difficult getting to Mars <clears throat> you know big problem <clears throat> so at <clears throat> that time <clears throat> Uh, we've been using some of the ex-Soviet uh, missiles, uh, SS-18, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, so I said, "Well, go and talk to to the Russians. You know, they 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 could do it." Anyway, when Elon went, he he, he and the Russians didn't sort of hit it off, <laughs> and and so he came back and said, "Well, I, I'm not. I, I'm going to do it myself." And so he that's how he got in, started up with SpaceX, and uh, and then he said, "Well, yeah, uh, we were thinking that." SSTL was outgrowing the university and we needed a bit of money and we needed to sort of make a transition. And he said, well, I'd like to take a small stake. So he took, I think it was a 10% stake yes. in um, SSTL for three or four years. Uh, and then when we sold, he he multiplied his investment. So he's, you know, clearly he, was, he, he knows what to invest in. Um, and uh, obviously he's gone off and done other things since then. And, and uh, you know, the, 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 the rest in his side is history. I mean, a fantastic achievement with... Uh, uh, Falcon, um, and again, very similarly, you know, the first two Falcons didn't work, and he was right down to his last cent. And I think he borrowed his cents from you know all his friends in order to get the third mission to be launched. Uh, fortunately, that worked. If it hadn't, you know, we wouldn't be where we are today. Um, so he, you know, he put his money where his uh, mouth was, and um, you know what we see now in the Starship launch we saw today, you know, the biggest the biggest rocket ever, apparently. Um, it's uh, pretty amazing, and that's going to transform space again. We can see it's going to be able to carry huge uh, masses into into space, both into orbit and beyond, uh, orbit and beyond, um, at a much more economic rate. So we're going to see a huge, huge change in shifting space manu you know, manufacturing from down here on Earth up into orbit and, and larger structures in orbit and so on. Mm -hmm. Of course, debris is going to be another, you know, Parallel issue. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it didn't end too well. That's not the problem. <laughs> it did the it did the important bit right. I mean, it was just when it was coming back that it went sideways and burned up or whatever. But <clears throat> yeah, the the important bit, which is getting up there and getting doing the trajectory, that's fine. No, they'll get it. I mean, these things. They'll get it right. Yeah, they'll get it right. I mean, if you look at the first. This is what the third launch. The yes, first the third, two yeah. have got incrementally better. Yeah. Give it another two launches, and he'll be fine. Yeah. Yep, yeah, yeah. No, it, it, yeah, it, it's an amazing achievement actually what Elon's done. And, and, and I mean that's the point to say here actually because what, what what Craig was saying that when you look at what we've done here at Surrey in, in the Space Centre and SSTL and all those missions. It's always a team effort. You see the people there that you know that any one of every single one of those was key. Keith has helped. Susan, mm -hmm. Craig, and others. Bob, you know, it, it's all done by people and teamwork. There's no doubt. You know, that's the key part. But the, I, as I say in my lecture in the in the short in the course, um, people ask, you know, what what is the magic that makes Surrey 
able to do this at such low cost? You know, is it the fact you use COTS technology and so on? No, it's the key technology is the people, is the team. And um, the, the, the key skill which Martin has is being able to pick uh, people who can work Foolish together. Foolish to come along and join. Yeah, <laughs> foolish enough to come and join, but can work together well and to work at a very high pace and very high level. And that reflects into what you're saying about Elon yeah. if you, at, at SpaceX. He, he does have a very hands-on approach, but he has that whole team behind him to do it. Mm. And you know, they, they are <clears throat> inspired and dedicated to, to, to work mm. at a pace which is you know, pretty demanding in order to achieve what mm. he's doing. Okay. Thank you, ever so much right. Thank you everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Honestly, very, very interesting. And just a quick note, if anyone's actually interested in doing any satellite stuff and also possibly receiving USAT-2 as part of EARS, we're trying to get our own satellite ground station on the old Kingborn house roof. And we've actually received, just before Christmas, some of the USAT carrier signals still to this day. So if anyone's interested in that, we'll be on our Discord and our email. But again, thank you very much for coming today and hopefully see you around soon. Thank you.